Okay, thanks. That sounds like like the Super Nintendo Pokemon. Sure. Okay, you got three of them? Yeah, no bad. I don't like it. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Uh, we still have. Yeah, I wonder if I can my fan off of the first one. That's one, two, three. That's one, two, three. No, it's still eight, man. Okay. I think I might just be too close to that speaker, physically. Oh, okay. yeah, that might be a problem. No, this one seems to be all right. I'm not getting any feedback. This one's not on. Oh. Oh, no. Is that? This one? Oh, no. The first rule of Twitch and YouTube streaming is that you will always have stuff. This is how it feels like five. Start on the left Yeah, this one works. It's just the middle one. YouTuber and uh, video content creator panel. Uh, I guess we will introduce ourselves. I am uh, Lurks, a part of RL Furry Productions. I'm a hobbyist YouTuber and uh, also create content for some other, uh, some social media as well. Um, I have a fairly small following, but I'm uh, very passionate about it. It's something I've been doing for about five and a half years. Uh, Never really hit the big time with it, but I've learned a lot along the way, and I do these panels pretty frequently, and I, I like sharing what I've learned with everyone else along my uh, my journey to uh, to trying to perfect my YouTube content, a never-ending journey to get to what you think might be perfect. Journey, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that is uh, that is me. I am Lurks. Sometimes I'm Rim, sometimes I'm Elwood, but uh, right now I'm Lurks. I'm, uh, I don't even know where it is. Hi, Lord. How well? I'm Odin Wolf. I've been doing furry YouTube for like, I don't know, five years now. I'm old. Um, yeah, I, I do YouTube. Um, I'm a professional, as you can see. Uh, that, what? It's your mic. It's your phone. <laughs> Wait, let. Does it? No, what the heck? Okay, anyway, yeah, I, I'm Odin Wolf. Hi. Um, I don't really stream much or anything, but I, I do YouTube, uh, and I switched to longer form YouTube videos more recently, so that's more my bag. But yeah, um, you, you can introduce yourself now. Sure. Hi, my name is Kite from Kite, so it's like longer than you may know. No one can hear it. No one can hear it. Or you can try to like really. Okay, can anyone hear me now? That's better. That's better? Okay. Yeah. Could someone shut the door? <laughs> All right, my name is Kite from Kite's Windswept Wanderings. You might know me uh, as the guy with the camera who runs around and records a bunch of furries. Uh, you might have seen my YouTube channel. I do primarily fur con footage, reviews. I do a little bit of gaming and uh, live streams. If you know what Pilk is, my condolences. Um, so I. I'm going to be celebrating my third anniversary of making content, and uh, I'm what people call a niche internet micro celebrity. You're so old, oh my god. <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, if I haven't taken a video of you, I will. That's not a threat, it's a promise. 
<laughs> oh, that's weird, bro. Hey, um, content is content. Yeah, and as you can tell, audio is some of the hardest part of video content creation. <laughs> how many how many people in this audience have made YouTube videos? They could be anything. Say, ah, and raise your hand. Uh, ah. That was the weakest. <laughs> More energy if you've done YouTube. Come on, go. Ah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, YouTube is fun at any level, honestly. It's even more fun when you're starting out, I think, like a newbie. It's extremely exciting, especially when you get to record all your memories that you, know, you want to share with people. I, I would highly recommend, even if you don't plan on doing it seriously, record stuff, start a YouTube channel, see if it's for you. It's, it's a lot of fun. I think this, this panel is going to be more of like a Q&A thing, right? Yeah, we're going to kind of keep it a, a bit informal, do it kind of like a Q&A. Uh, this, this stuff is applicable to other platforms as well, not just YouTube. Really anything involving video content production. Uh, there was a Twitch panel earlier that some of you may have attended. That's probably more, you know, that's where you should have been for if you're really looking to do streaming stuff. But we can talk about that too. You know, this is applicable to TikTok, you know, social media, pretty much anything. Yeah, we're um, the YouTuber panel. So yeah, we don't have some big structured thing to do for you with PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff because who wants to watch PowerPoints when they're on vacation at a con? So we're here to share our knowledge with you and, uh, and answer questions and talk about whatever you want us to talk about. So yeah, if you have a question about to any of us specifically or about YouTube in general <gasps> or anything like that. You can raise your hand and uh, yeah. So who have, I saw a hand already up like right there, whoever that is. Scream, what is your question? How did you find your niche and how do you know if, if you have found yours in the answer? How do we find our niche and how do we know if we found it? Uh, that's interesting because when I first started YouTube like five or six years ago, uh, I started out my concept was am I, oh, My concept was doing things in fursuit like that was gonna be my gimmick just like I tried to make a cake in fursuit I tried to do whatever in fursuit and after a while I started I started to realize like wow That's cute for a few videos, but eh. And then like over time I started to like experiment with a bunch of different video types and different video topics and I sort of see what the audience responds to and what they like, but for my niche, it was always furry YouTube. You know, I'm a furry YouTuber. Everything's furry related. Uh, some people go with more broad. Some people don't even target furries. It just depends. I say always go with your interest. And if you're really interested in something, it usually shows through in the camera and other people will be interested in it too. Okay. Why, thank you. Um, I started out, I think, with um, kind of a mix of furry and music. Uh, I'm a guitarist and a bassist, and that was sort of the niche that I thought I could fill. Um, since then, I found that that was maybe a little bit too much of a niche, that a lot of people weren't that interested in it, so I moved on to more general furry content, uh, educational, informative, current events type content. So I, I don't know if I found my niche or not yet, but it's... Uh, I've kind of gotten to where I know what I'm going to do and I know what I'm not going to do and if people choose to watch it, that's awesome and if they choose to watch somebody else, that's awesome for them. So how I started out was actually during the big VTuber boom uh, during the end times as we uh, know it because if you say COVID on YouTube, you get demonetized. No, uh, it's fine now? No, it's fine now? Okay. Yeah, it's, fine for a while. it's still a rumor. Anyway, uh, as you, if you know what a VTuber is, uh, it's not so much a niche as it is a chasm. So um, well, I started out because of, yeah, it's, it's huge. There's so many VTubers. <laughs> it's so easy to get into VTubing. Um, I err on the side of both live streaming and long form content with some shorts. So my perspective might be a little different from my co-hosts here, um, because I think live content is a fantastic way to cut your teeth on content creation, as well as learn how to turn those lives into longs and shorts. Uh, but to get into more detail, uh, after the pandemic, I wanted to kind of record the first furry con. Uh, 
that happened after the pandemic, and I was megaplex. And I kind of found my niche there, not after one year, not after two years, after three years before the algorithm picked me up and found my audience. Where I'm going with this is, if you pick a niche and you're passionate about something and you have something to share with the world, that's great. But exposure is king, and until somebody finds you, you can have the best content in the world, nobody will know you exist, unfortunately. And so a niche is only a niche if the algorithm thinks you belong there. So it took me three years to really skyrocket. I gained like 20,000 subs in, what, like four months? It was crazy. But... Um, Congratulations. Yeah, it was insane. Like once, uh, once the algorithm figured out, hey, these furry people will like your channel, it's like, hey, here you go. But I, uh, since then, I'm very analytics focused. I'm very hard uh, data focused. And if you think you have a niche and you think your audience exists, go for it. But statistically speaking, you will need to spend two to three years training the algorithm to make your channel visible through exposure. And that's why I think YouTube is the best platform for live shorts and longs. And I'll say I can start a TED Talk on this. Maybe I will next time. Uh, but hopefully that gives you a really big cross section of um, how to not only figure your niche out, but how to actually make your niche work for you. Because I think that is the more important question is, how do you get your exposure to make the people who will love you find you in the first place? And that's what I think niching really is. It's really hard. It's it really, I've been doing it forever and my channel's like starting to stagnate and it's making me sad. Do not spend <laughs> money on ads. It actually negatively impacts your channel. Just putting that out there. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Next question. Like you. How do you get the confidence to post your first video? How do you get the confidence to post your first video? Um, you turn on your camera. Your microphone's aggressive. I mean, just like, like, I think you need to freaking calm down, please. Thank you. Oh my god. Um, so you just record yourself. And it might be weird for the first X amount of time seeing yourself, hearing yourself, because you're going to have to edit it too. Um, just do it, like uh, like a cliche Nike uh, saying, just do it. Like legit, the, for YouTube, I just went, I'm gonna do it. And then I did it, and I, and I edited it and posted it, and I didn't expect anything out of it. Never in a million years would I think it would be my job. Um, and that, that got lucky and that happened, you know, and I posted videos every week or whatever, but you just get into it. And like, it's fun. I always recommend starting it out as just a hobby and for funsies um, and letting it go from there. But yeah, turn on a camera and record. And you know, even if you end up not liking it, you don't have to post it. It's not a big deal, you know? There's no pressure. And you can edit it down to anything you want people to see. It's not, you know, you have full control over it. So it's very comforting in that way. You control what people see when it's a recorded video. So just do it. That's my advice. And I would say content creation is a skill anyone can learn, just like drawing, just like programming, just like any other skill. But it requires practice, and it requires a certain amount of self-confidence. Like, for example, I'm sure everybody hates their voice. Everybody hated my voice. And I, I people, love my voice! I hate my voice! And now everybody wants me to do ASMR, so I don't know what that means. That's because ASMR is great. Ah, yes, this definitely makes me tingle in the shape of whatever the hell you say. Anyway, <laughs> no one says that. No one, really, says no one has ever said that. Um, <clears throat> Mers, you, no, I can't say that word. Anyway, um, so um, my, my point is just do it, learn from your mistakes, and when you're small, that's the perfect time to branch out into a whole bunch of stuff and figure out what you like doing. Because passion and authenticity translates into great content. And honestly, I hate that word, content. But that's what you're doing. You're taking your passion and your authenticity and taking it to work. Just do it. Just do it. The first one is the hardest. Once you get through that, once you've posted something, it gets easier after that. I remember my first one. Um, I, was, I had no experience with content production whatsoever. So my learning curve happened in front of the audience. And some of my earlier stuff was admittedly pretty cringy and had some mistakes and had some some terrible audio and all kinds of issues like that but i kept going i didn't lose confidence when i looked back on it and said 
said, oh, that's not great. I said, okay, it's not great now. What can I do to make it better? And I just continued pushing forward, and that may be part of the reason that my channel didn't take off in the beginning is that, like I said, everybody was watching my learning curve from complete novice to whatever I am now. So just keep going with it. Don't give up if you have a disappointing video and nobody watches it or you just don't like it. Somebody's going to like it. Multiple people are going to like it. Yeah. And that is a, a great point. If you want some homework, go to any one of our channels, watch our first video, and watch our most recent video. How dare you suggest that? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's I just rude. My own video. I rewatch my own videos. Oh my god. My first video, I see it, and I'm like, oh my god, how did I edit this? This is terrible. And two years from now, I'm going to be looking at my current stuff and also be thinking that. But to put it in perspective, um, like I said, I come from a live background on Twitch before I swapped to YouTube. Some people say three people isn't a lot watching you. Some people say 10 people isn't a lot. Some people say 20 isn't a lot. Everything's relative. Yeah, it's relative. How yeah. many people do we have here now? 40? Could you imagine an entire auditorium like this looking at you? What about 1,000 views? What about 10,000 views? How many people have you brightened the day of? Yeah, it's really funny when I started. I remember, like, uh, you know, everything's relative. I had a small subscriber base. When I hit, like, 5,000... Relax. Oh my God. When I hit like 5,000 video views on a video, I get excited, you know? And then after a while, it was like 10,000. And then like it became like 20,000 was the baseline. This is about after a week or whatever. And like it, it's just interesting as time changes, your expectations change and stuff. And sometimes they can lower over time because YouTube's really difficult. But yeah. The algorithm can and will screw you over it can give it wonderful ways. It can take it. Yeah. How about another uh, questionino? I can't see anything, so if some uh, you you get to pick the next person. I picked it before. Um, you and the white coat then. Never mind. What? Oh. <laughs> Someone has their hand up. Oh, oh. <laughs> Would you like me to stand up or? Uh, sure. This is yeah. Yeah, easy if so, would there be anything for content creation more so regarding photography, whether it be in person or virtual reality? What do you mean? Um, oh. I had the idea of doing content themed around photography, like doing. Uh, landscape in VR chat and making just kind of photographing posts every once in a while and starting off like that. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll let you feel this one since I'm getting into VR uh, chat content creation. That is a that is a niche. There are accounts on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and other post-based social media services uh, who make it their content to go search out and find the most interesting VR chat worlds and take scenic pictures or short clips or videos to really bring out the best of that world. They're really out adding out all the slurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 well, you don't play on public worlds for a reason, and then you have all the jingle bones, and we can't talk about them. Anyway, uh, my jingle point bones. is, that's what they call them. Okay. Anyway, deep, I can't make that joke. Anyway, um, my point is, if you want to do VR chat content, uh, videography and photography are excellent, especially since uh, VR chat has a photo, I, I'm sure you, it has a photo and video feature that is basically the same as a modern uh, mirrorless camera. Um, for photography, if you're talking about YouTube, that's a little harder, because YouTube, I mean, obviously, is a visual animated format. You do videos. I recommend doing that on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, there are accounts that already do that. It's a fantastic niche. I think you should go for it. But if you do, um, this is actually something I'm gonna be doing later, so don't steal my idea, I'm kidding. Um, make highlight reels of worlds from VR chat, and if you find a super cool world, make like a travel video about it. That would be perfect for a short or a YouTube video, and you could combine your love with photography with a newfound interest in videography. Or at least that would be my recommendation. So, uh, did, did I kind of answer your question? I figured it would have been a bit off the path, saying it's more singular photos than actual videos, but it still helps. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend uh, Twitter or Instagram for photos, uh, unless you want to try making PowerPoints of 
VR chat worlds, but I, I think your primary competition will come from VTubers uh, or people with furry avatars who are actually exploring the world in real time, either in lives or long form. Um, bit of an aside, your competition also matters. We all want everybody to succeed, but the reality is you are in a competitive space and you have to look at other people's content to know the market and learn as well. So that might be something to think about. Oh yeah, um, our friend in the white and black jacket. I wouldn't say it's any easier or harder. Uh, being a YouTuber is just whatever you make of it. Um, furry does make you, it limits your topics to an extent. Um, if you think about it, there are YouTubers who are furries, like uh, YMS is probably like the biggest one. He really sucks. He's a furry, but doesn't do furry YouTube. He does movie reviews. Uh, versus, you know, like us, we do furry YouTube content. I, I don't know, I think it's like the same level of difficulty. Yeah. So, uh, I almost disagree with that, because sure, we have Save the Spark, we have Soda Poppins, they're, they're YouTubers who appeal to the normie audience, and it's quite obvious that their content isn't furry content. Um, as a furry YouTuber, I take a lot of pride in curating my comments. I shadow ban five to six people a day with anti-furry names just to keep my comments clean. Uh, you're also niching down severely heavily. So even having a furry YouTuber avatar, what I've learned during my Twitch phase, people would much rather watch an anime girl, like a human girl with you know ears and a tail, than they would watch a furry. And that's, you know, first impressions, especially as a live streamer, are important. Um, I wouldn't say that it is, well, it's like saying, oh, is a 0.01% chance of success better than a 0.02% chance of success? Is it harder necessarily? <laughs> That's grim. Yeah, sorry, I'm very realistic with my statistics. Um, but my point is... I am trying um, to do it anyway, though. <laughs> like, jeez, do it anyway. Uh, YouTube. It's fun. Um, but a, you're very analytic driven, driven right? Yeah, I, like you're I, very driven by very numbers. Very analytics driven. But so YouTube is more than like that for a lot of people. Some people yeah, just yeah. want to do it for funsies. So it's not to discourage you. Like you don't have to do it to try to reach the biggest audience you can. You can just do it to show your friends or you know a smaller platform, and that's okay too. It depends you know? on your goals. Yeah, of course. And yeah. Yeah. goals are all different. Yeah, I think uh, honestly, what I think is more important is everybody record and share their memories because 10 years from now you are going to be history like the history of our fandom of our culture so i'm so old I, i'm getting off topic anyway so uh, is it harder being a furry youtuber by the nature of niching down and niching down so much and with normal people being not always receptive i would say yes it's harder but it comes with a different set of challenges and a different set of rewards, as with all niches. Um, therefore, you have to decide whether this is worth niching down or if you want to be like Soda Poppins or Saber Spark, where they are furries and they're out furries and their community know they're furries, but they have a human avatar and they talk about normal human things like anime and cartoons. So I, I think that's my perspective on it. What do you like my microphone? Yeah, you're definitely, by making furry content, you're definitely reducing your potential audience, and that could be a good or a bad thing. If you're making mainstream content, yeah, it's going to appeal to a lot more people. Furry content is going to, to turn a lot of people off if they don't like the fandom or they don't understand it. But if that's what you want to do and that's your passion, I would definitely encourage you to do that. That's my situation. I have a negligible subscriber base. My channel will probably never see 10,000 subscribers. It's and not true, you can do it. You can do it. I keep going because we that's what I do. Like, I want to do furry content specifically. I don't care about the numbers as much anymore. And that is what makes me happy. And the few viewers that I do have, it's what they like to see. So I, I know I'm making a few people happy. And But if you do care about big numbers, um, yeah, more mainstream the better. You just you just have a much wider potential audience out there. The less 
to go on a tangent really quick about that too is that the numbers like uh, you know I had this like period of really explosive growth where my channel got really big and then it seemed like no matter what I do it kind of stagnated and I started to fixate on that and that led to a lot of depression um, but after a while I finally said um, I don't care anymore I'm gonna make what I want to make and I'm enjoying it a lot more now. Like I'm doing these hour plus long videos on topics that I find super interesting and they take longer to put out, a lot more work, but like I feel more fulfilled and I feel like it's showing more of my work. So it's, it's difficult because it is my job. Like I do need patrons, <laughs> patreon.com slash I do need patrons to like live, you know, like that's a big source of my income. But I feel like when I just cared about the numbers, it just led to more unhappiness with me and it was starting to reflect in my work because I was doing weekly videos and I couldn't keep it up. And I'm a lot happier now doing these like cool uh, dives into like inflatables or room 366. Uh, I'm gonna revisit the weird side of furries four because I did that like years ago and I'm like, I could do that so much better now. And I'm gonna do like a video on uh, plush, you know, like that side of the fandom and um, I want to I wanna learn about uh, Therians, because I don't understand it, and it's always fun to learn about a new topic. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like, numbers are important, but if you focus on them too much, even if it is your job, boy, can it lead to some depression. So I just want to give that aside and say, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm learning and changing as I go, too, after all these years. Yeah. So does anyone have a question? <laughs> Oh, you want to touch on it? Okay. Here's the microphone. <laughs> so, and, and yeah, um, just to touch on it really quickly, numbers, you know, big number is always nice and it's an ego satisfying goal. Um, one of the first things you learn in YouTube is big number doesn't always mean good and subscribers don't always mean a successful channel. So it's something not to fixate on. What is important is being better a little bit every day, uh, making content that you enjoy because you won't burn out. I mean, if you notice, uh, I've been dealing with a little of that myself if you watch my channel. And don't look at numbers, number bad. Make sure you do what you enjoy doing, or else you know your content will feel authentic and it'll just you know dry up too. But yeah, we have another question. I have one over here. What is your question? <laughs> Exactly about YouTube, but where did you get your stuff built? Oh, um, like, uh, what kind of stuff built? Or, no, the bell on the neck. What? Your bell. Oh, okay. your bell. My bell. Uh, this is a drowsy seal original. They release uh, five to six uh, different bells, but I believe they're open for commissions. Please check them out, drowsy seal on Twitter. Very nice. It doesn't jingle though, it's just a question. I don't care, we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I love them. Uh, I know that they bend in Oklahoma if you if you see them. I bend here, check me out in the adult. <laughs> check out as well for all of your sports and sculpture needs. In the back. Uh, what's some video editing software y'all would suggest using? Good question. Oh yes, the um the the ever controversial question on video editing software. My answer to this is to find what works for you, what's intuitive for you, and don't worry about what other people say, and don't worry about name brands or... Yeah, but what do you use? I personally, I'm weird, I use a free program called Shotcut that was, um, it was the high, like, I think the highest recommended free program um, back when I started, and I learned it well enough that I can just rip through editing with it. I'm just so experienced with it now that I've stuck with it. I've tried to move to DaVinci Resolve, uh, which was a complete failure. So I just kind of stuck with what I learned first, what was intuitive for me, what worked for me, and what I'm good at. Because I work 40 hours a week. I don't have time to be spending endless hours on editing. I gotta rip through it on my days off and get content out there. So basically, I just went with what does the job and what lets me do it efficiently. 
I use Adobe Premiere Creative Cloud. I use the expensive one you have to pay for every month. It's because I'm also like, I've used uh, Photoshop since high school and I love it and they work together very well and Premiere is very uh, intuitive, I find. Uh, I like the like layers. Of, I, don't, I like Adobe Premiere. It's what I use. It's expensive though. It sucks to pay that much, but it's what I've always used and I've always liked. So that, that's my recommendation if you can afford it. So, uh, I personally use Caroline Trail on my fan. So, I personally use uh, Adobe Premiere and Photoshop as well. Uh, although, I highly recommend looking up your Russian friend on Reddit. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, DaVinci is also amazing, and it's free, and has amazing color grading software. So, I would totally, totally try uh, DaVinci Resolve. I may be moving to that uh, because the iPad version is amazing, and the L9 series of camera, uh, the ecosystem is getting much better. Uh, but that is a very shock answer. So what I'm getting at is every artist likes their own program, every artist likes their own pen. Some people like Krita, some people like, like Photoshop, some people like Clip Studio Pro. My recommendation is research a whole bunch of video editing software, see what works for your workflow, and if you don't need to pay a thousand dollars a year for Adobe, if you're just not editing, that much. I'm being hyperbolic. But if you, all you're doing is like editing shorts, consider CapCut. It's a free yeah. app. Uh, if all you're doing is editing some lo uh, you know long form, DaVinci Resolve just as good as Premiere, better color. DaVinci Twin. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is free for the non-studio version. If you need to use the studio version, you know why you have to pay for it. Um, if you need Photoshop, I can't help you there. There's a Reddit link that might help you. I can't tell you anything. That bad. That's it. No. <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad, bad me. Uh, anyway, um, it is morally ethical. No, I'm not saying it. Anyway, uh, my Bye. use tools. Bye. Uh, there's other tools you want to use. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. I'm just, goodbye. Watch your channel. Like, comment, and subscribe. Like. <laughs> it's just like streaming for real. You see the numbers dip. No. Um, oh. What time is it? Anyway, I'm curious. Okay, one per one person. What what time is it? Seven o two. Okay, and does this go to seven thirty? I don't even know. You're wrong. It's seven o three. Oh, now it is. Oh wow. Okay, I'm sorry. It's seven o three. Oh, wow. All right. Do we have another question? No, but you have more people leaving. I'm gonna cry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Someone must have a burning question about YouTube. What? What do you want? What? It's not about YouTube. It's about the underwear. Oh yeah. No, Jesus Christ. Here, yeah. Here, talk about your underwear. Okay, um, I'm very excited to wear my uh, my favorite pair of tie-dye underwear tonight, and um, unfortunately I was informed by the convention staff that I was not allowed to do so until 7 p.m., so I, I wanted to make sure they uh, that I had them with me so I could don them immediately upon being permitted to do so, which I failed to do because it's now 7.04 probably. I've been allowed to wear them for four minutes. But yeah, there's a whole story with these. It's not like a... Thing. It's, it's this joke that runs all the way back to TFF 2018, basically. I, like, this character is like, uh, it, he's kind of tied to the tie-dye on these. Tied? Tie-dye? Oh, really oh, bad. Oh, oh. That's why I call it good brand. Oh, whoa! Uh, Hi! Uh, oh, I see wow. a hand up in the back. Do you have a question? I see a hand up in the back. <laughs> Do you want to help okay. <laughs> What's your question? Um, do you ever feel embarrassed filming in public? And if so, like, how do you deal with that? Um, I was, uh, I was completely intimidated to ever do any public suiting outside of a convention environment, and I finally got the nerve up to do it, and I, I like wasn't going to do it, and I chickened out a bunch of times, and finally I got the nerve to do it, and it was awesome. Um, it was like 75% plus of the engagements that I had from the public were positive, and it ended up actually being a really good thing. So it, it is a little embarrassing or intimidating in my case at first, thinking people are going to be furry haters, or they're going to misunderstand the fandom, and 
think you're some kind of pervert and like oh. grab their children oh. and run away and kind of thing. I ended up actually getting a very overall positive reaction. I suited in a number of different places during a, a little vacation through Colorado and I, I found it to be a really good experience but uh, your experience may vary. Just uh, just be aware that it could, it could turn ugly potentially. I don't first in public. I don't do it. I don't like it. I don't like attention from normies at all. Um, I don't. I don't relish in it. I don't want uh, random people pulling on my fursuit parts, or even in today's climate, worse. Uh, I just don't want to deal with it. So I already have enough anxiety. I don't need uh, quote unquote normies interacting with my fursuit because I don't really care what they think at all. Uh, I am interested in the fandom and that sort of thing. I'm not interested in being some sort of ambassador to normal like I just I just don't care so personally I don't public person that that's not interesting to me um, I know I'm weird in that but no not my thing so uh, for me I have a quite a few uh, videos about public fursuiting and my experience is people will either love you or they will hate you and call the police on you I will present to you an example. Um, on the West Coast, we have the California kimono furs, and we regularly go uh, to the like Japanese town, Japanese district, uh, to do Christmas videos. And like we showed up in our Christmas attire, and Shogun Santa is there. We take uh, group photos. Everybody's like rocking. Everybody's polite. Everyone's awesome. The um, the like boss district manager shows up and talks to me. It's like you guys are welcome here any time. You don't have to ask. You can show up and just do it. We tried the same thing at Chinatown, and we had three minutes before the police escorted us off the premises. Yeah. Um, that was actually a lot faster than I thought because the uh, the renta cops on bikes were already eyeing us as we left our car. Um, what my point is: know your audience. Know where you're allowed to do this. Um, I'm going to ask myself, I live in Vegas. You cannot wear a fursuit in public in Vegas because of mask laws. And avoid, and avoid a beach off. Yeah, like I, I left a selfie museum and had my fursuit on. Five minutes, we had cops walking up to us telling us to take it off because it was illegal and you could go to jail for it. Know where you can. But that would make such a good video. I was arrested for wearing a fursuit. Oh well, yeah, but it's also big. not clickbait. Please pay my bail. Go fund me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, to use on my short. Love it. Um, but yeah, uh, know your audience. Know who is going to be receptive. Ask for permission. You would be surprised. Sometimes I get ghosted. Sometimes a restaurant will be like, you want to do a review as a big fluffy animal? That's awesome. Do it. Show up. We're so happy to have you here. Um, this is a bit under the radar. I know a lot of content creators whose rule is you have, once you show up at a scene, you have five minutes, get all your shots done, stage, get ready, get out. Nobody sees you, then it's no problem. That I don't recommend because you're probably gonna break a lot of laws and the cops will come and you'll have to explain why you're a big fluffy animal with a $4,000 camera rig. And that never goes well. That reminds me of like Mega64, have you ever watched? Mega 64. Yeah, yeah. I love Mega 64. Yeah, they're they're the best skits in public videos. I love them. Yeah, but they don't. They're not disrespectful about it. They're just like yeah, fun, but which is great. Like the Chinatown example. Some people will see you say, "Oh hell no," and immediately call the cops. So, at worst, ask for per permission because asking for forgiveness in our climate is very Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Um, that's, that's the logistics of it. How do I feel about fursuiting in public? I love being a big, fluffy, giant animal. Uh, I feel more comfortable in my fursuit than I do in my flesh puppet. Uh, oh. Honestly, I would wear my fursuit 24-7 if it wouldn't make me fired. So, that's how I feel. But do you not like the word flesh puppet? Flesh puppet. Yeah. No, I don't like the word flesh puppet. Flesh puppet. Nar. What is the next question about for YouTube? I saw that hand quote first. Is there another one? We'll, we'll do that one first and then someone over there next. Uh, so, one of the questions I've had is uh, what to do about like, when you start dealing with anxiety of like, posting content, you know, you start kind of going stale and you want to try to get motivation. 
So he's saying, what, what do you do with the anxiety and like, uh, yeah, the, the, the feeling stale and wanting to do more content, right? Yeah. Um, you just do what you want. Hello? Hello? Excuse me? <sighs> now, yeah, just do what you want to do is the best way to do it. And like, I always used to recommend do at least a video a week, and that's what I did for like four years nonstop. Um, and that, that's, that's not a bad uh, advice, but it's not a like, I feel like after a while, it's like how many things can you do week after week after week after week and like care about everything you're making. And so I started to get anxious about like just needing to upload every week and like, I just, I just started to do what I wanted to do. And that cleared up a lot of anxiety for me and made it easier. And that ringing is the most distracting thing on earth. Well, if it makes you feel better, I 100% agree. Uh, what I want to add is burnout, burnout is not an if, it's a when. And one of the most important things I've heard in my career from one of my friends, who's a psychologist, said, if for any reason you don't like your hobby and you're not having fun, stop, do something else, come back to it later. Because you're making it worse if you're going to be forcing yourself to do it. And sometimes you might feel like you have to, you have to keep that momentum going, you have to keep the algorithm fed. But you might be harming yourself in the long run. Seymour. Exactly. Um, my point is, take care of yourself. Self care is extremely important. And if your hobby isn't nurturing you as much as you nurture it, maybe it's time to yeah, set it aside. Take a little break. Uh, get new ideas. One thing I learned from another bigger streamer is uh, they said to live your life more than you're making content because the experiences you have in your life outside of making content feed back into your content, especially useful for streaming. Because some people be like, oh, I don't have anything to talk about. Yeah, because you're not living. Like, the people who are on you're stream. Not yeah, no, for real. Like, watch any top, like, 10 streamer. They'll be talking about, oh, yeah, I, I saw the new movie, and then I did this, and then I went on my yacht, and then I went outside, and my dog peed on my shoes, and Northern Lion showed up, and he started talking about some 80s band I never heard of. And, like, they just keep going and going and going. And you kind of realize these people have three-day stream schedules for a reason, because living is content as well. Oh, I hate saying that. Living, so yeah. Yeah, go live. Touch grass for content. You said touch grass for content. Yeah, no, touch grass. If you feel bad, I'm not going to touch grass. Touch grass. <laughs> it's psychologically proven to help. I think our friend over here was next, and then we'll go back to the side. What time is it? 13. 13 after? Okay, good. We're still good to go 17 more minutes. Okay, what? So, puzzle vicious. What is your question? Next question. Next question. How do y'all feel about the uh, exposure you get through like collaborations with like larger YouTubers and stuff, or like um, exposure from like being collabed with like a smaller YouTuber? Collabs are great, regardless of if it's. With a larger or a smaller YouTuber, you're basically you're helping somebody out, or they're helping you out, or you're helping each other out. You're doubling your audience potentially. If your channels are around the same size, you're doubling your audience. If you got somebody, maybe they have a bunch of subscribers who have never seen you before, and you have a bunch of subscribers that have never seen them before. Collabs are one of the absolute best things you can do. Um, if somebody approaches you wanting to do a collab, though or you want to approach somebody for a collab, please have an idea already. Don't just be like, oh, look, it's it's Odin Wolf. I love your stuff. You want to do a collab? I, I no! Don't, I don't have any ideas. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you do, right? I don't... I don't like I don't I don't really do collabs much anymore, but I, I sometimes do videos where I ask people to send in clips because I like featuring other furry YouTubers at any size. Um, I don't know if it's a boost for them. I like it, when I featured you in my video, did you notice any like difference or like bumping subs or anything? Um, early on, 
when I when I appeared in larger YouTubers' videos like some of yours and like Rage Hound, uh, I, I did notice the big bump in subs. Now, because I've been in enough collabs on yours, I think your audience knows me. It's kind of like the people who are going to subscribe because of that have already. Yeah. So the the bump was very pronounced in the beginning, and then it sort of trailed off. But I still love doing it, so I still contribute. Yeah, I just like having YouTubers of like, I don't care if their channel's like 10 subs or whatever, if I go, because I have a furry YouTuber chat um, that's open to join it as long as you're actively making furry YouTube content. Uh, it's just called furry YouTube content creators. Um, do you want to, do you want to like tweet out that link or something, one of you? And people could join, hello, Riv? Riv. Oh, you're <laughs> Sorry, your mouth is full. Yeah, if one of you wants to like tweet out the link after this for people to join, as long as you're actively making for YouTube content, uh, that is where I will be like, hey, I have this idea. If you guys want to like record a quick cameo or whatever, and I'll credit you and like get out there. That's that's always an option. But yeah. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I am extremely numbers uh, based in terms of analytics and uh, looking at what I can do. Uh, not only to improve my content in a subjective way, but an objective way, because YouTube's analytics suite gives you a lot of information. Exposure is a very weird thing to deal with. Uh, case in point, uh, from the VTuber tag, I would get 500 impressions, well, less than 500 impressions a month. The Vore tag gave me 5,000 impressions. It's so true! It is. The Vore meta <laughs> is real. Uh, what? If you want to learn about that, what? go to my stream. Oh, it's ridiculous. Anyway, um, so where I'm going with this, four tag, 5,000 viewers, YouTuber tag, 500 impressions, furry tag, like 250 impressions. I get 4 million impressions a month because I have a YouTube. Uh, I'll let that whiplash settle in right there. Impressions, exposure, all that stuff. The collabs I have done, they have been very fun. I have enjoyed collabing with my fellow creators. But if we're talking about hard analytics and benefit towards exposure, those bumps don't translate into long-term gains. So if you want to be really pessimistic about it, exposure is based more off algorithms and like throwing darts at a board. Because I'm sure some people will be like, oh, I, uh, I collabed with Ninja and now I'm super popular because I'm you know, Tim the Tap Man's friend or something like that. Um, but ultimately, collabs should be because you enjoy making content with your creators. Like, um, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of free creators have a group of friends they love doing things with, and they rise together. And I think that's the more important part of collabs. Don't look at that as like, oh, Odin Wolf, you're so amazing. Thank you so much for bringing me to this panel. I'm going to get exposure from 60 extra people. Oh my god. No, my, my point is, our fortunes rise and fall together. And it's the people you collab with. It's not a one-time, oh, I get a, a boost because I get a shout-out on somebody's channel. Make content with your friends. Because that is the stuff people will come back to. Because they'll be like, oh man, they're collabing together again? And they were so good last time? That's how you get good exposure. That's how you get good content. Don't think of it as pure analytics or numbers. Yeah, there's a really this is coming from the analytics guy. There's a really good case study of a furry YouTuber that I shall not name because he's like Voldemort. He was featured in no, really. He was featured in a Shane Dawson video back in the day, and now you probably know who I'm talking about. Ugh, I never want to repeat his name, but he that was an interesting example of him having like. 30,000 subs maybe, and then overnight he had like over 100,000, and it was the most hollow subscribers ever. Like it translated to like a video doing well after the, that, and then after that it was just like the same level. It was just all empty subs. So you could collaborate with the, like, with Mr. Beast and he'll probably give you like a couple hundred extra like dedicated subscribers and then no one else really cares. Yeah, subscribers are actually, um, to give you a bit of a spoiler for monetization YouTube, 1,000 subscribers is the most important milestone you'll ever hit because it allows you to be monetized. 10,000 used to unlock a bunch of stuff, it's unlocked at 1,000 now. Subscribers don't matter unless you need social proof or the black hole effect kicks in, and that's jargon you probably don't want to learn. So, also, like, you, you, the advertising money, that I made on YouTube. Even in my prime, 
you could not live off of. It was because of the generosity of patrons that I was ever able to do it as a wedding. Like seriously, yeah. if you if you ever wanted, thanks Becky and Robert and Timmy and whoever else is a, a patron in here. But yeah, get into YouTube if you think. Yeah, it's not. Don't. don't <laughs> it's not. I would never, especially today, get into this for the aspiration of it being your job. It, maybe extra income, maybe, but mo mostly for fun teeth. Yeah. What time is it now? Seven twenty. Seven twenty. We could do like one or two more. You you, you can pick. I can't see. I'm blind in two. Um, okay. You and then the person in the back. Make them quick. Okay, so this one's gonna be quick because we don't have much time. Always put furry in your title is what I find, and I even find being redundant saying furry fursuit, as stupid as that looks in a title, yes, will yes, yes, lead yes, to yes. more SEO of uh, people clicking on your content. Thumbnails are ungodly important. You want them clean, you want them simple, you want them to like, you see it, and you're gonna wanna click on it. You don't need to put words in your thumbnail. Sometimes it's okay. You don't need to put the title on your thumbnail. It's, it's just unnecessary. Clean, simple, and eye-catching. You know what I mean? Or if you're Mr. Beast, just put an O face in every thumbnail. But There's yeah. a ton of guides for how to make a video catchy, um, but I'm also going to say, just because you do everything right, YouTube can just say, here's 12 views, go away. Um, I've had my absolute worst short that I've ever made with glitched out audio and, and visuals is my best performing short in, in reality. The short I spent three days on uh, it's stuck at like 2,000 views. So don't take it personally if your magnum opus flops because YouTube doesn't get it. Um, other than that, keep throwing darts at that dartboard. Thank you. Yes. I think we have one more person in the back. Let's move on to the next question. There's someone over there. In the back? No. In the back? No. What's the nature of Black Universe and everything? 42. Next question. What was your question? In what capacity? Like, what are your limits? What are your, um, what do you... If it makes you uncomfortable, that's a boundary. And stop immediately. Don't let your audience let you do things you don't like. Um, so for me, I don't respond to uh, most DMs, period, full stop. Uh, even if they have positive intentions, because a lot of time people I've learned over time that sometimes people will like reel you in by saying something positive and then like start to cling on you and ask you a bunch of questions and like be buddy buddy and it's there's a thing called a parasocial relationship where you think you know a content creator because they make videos and you know a lot about them but they don't know anything about you or sometimes vice versa rarely. Um, I always keep a distance from uh, most people unless and this is this is a little bit of a plug but unless they're my patron and they join my Discord, uh, I. I've actually met some of my best friends in my entire life there, but those are people that are 18 plus, get their ID checked, and then like join voice chat, or we become friends, but um, but random people, like, you know, I'm totally cool saying hi, taking pictures, whatever, small chat, that's fine, but when it comes to a deeper relationship with completely random people, uh, you, you gotta be careful. And, and, and uh, no, this goes without saying, but if you're over 18, just don't talk to minors, period, full stop, ever. Just don't, yeah. No. Yeah, one simple little trick that I learned in that regard, just for basic, basic interactions, is every, every time, it, it, leave a heart or a thumbs up on every comment. It, as long as it's not like a toxic comment, then remove those, but I always interact with that. I think people that just gives people the idea that you're listening to what they're saying. And sometimes you don't even read the content all the way, the comment all the way through. But I've heard that, that was actually a YouTube video I watched on, on tips and tricks for success with YouTube was, uh, doing that, interacting with just those comments. And yeah, be careful who you interact with. If you get randos wanting to talk to you, sometimes it ends up being bad. I had a really bad uh, parasocial relationship type situation a couple years ago, which was a very nice person. I felt terrible, but I had to block them, and I shouldn't have ever let it get to that point. I should have just been like, I should have just ignored them, which sucks to say, but. It can be hard to say no to someone who seems you know, genuine, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably time. What'd you say? Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes. We could just do our like 
lightning question. One more in the back. What was it? Was there one? Yep. Go ahead. I see your hands up. Uh, so how do you keep like real life away from camera life? Because sometimes I feel like I record too much and it's a bit intrusive. So how do you know the difference between keeping it for the camera and then keeping it in the moment? How do y'all manage that? I personally, I am very adamant about completely separating my furry life and my personal life. I have different social media accounts. I have different email addresses. I completely separate the two. I have a, I'm in a job where I have to maintain a professional, a professional image and I don't really want that to, I don't really want my fandom involvement to be out there and wrapped up with my personal life. So I go out of my way to separate the two and that kind of helps if you do that it kind of helps you overall just keep the two separate in your own mind. It's, at least that's how I deal with it. Some people are very out there with the fact that they're a furry, and I'm definitely not. You will not see me do a face reveal, for instance. For, for me, I, uh, I, I do videos where I definitely open up and talk about very deep topics. Uh, but that's recorded, and you know I'm controlling still what I put out there. Um, when it comes to social media, I learned to not have a main Twitter because I could say the most positive thing in the world and furries will somehow spin it into something negative because I am a bigger YouTuber or whatever, bigger furry in the fandom. So I've learned to like, if there's a furry drama, like an old person says something crappy about uh, gun control or something, I don't, I'm not gonna comment on it, you know what I mean? Like, whatever the, the new thing that furries are mad about, literally every day on Twitter, uh, I used to feel the need to comment on or whatever, I just don't. I just keep it to myself. I just have an AD Twitter and that's it because I, I feel comfortable with that. But yeah, I just realized that even if I think it's completely positive and I'm putting out positive vibes, someone will spin it negative. So I try to keep it just to YouTube videos where I open up. And yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, for me, if uh, any of you watching, me, you know that the fursuit head does not come off. Uh, most people don't know. Yeah, uh, most people don't know what I look like, and I like it that way. My flesh puppet and kite live two separate lives, and I tend to keep it that way. Um, and if people see me in like a fursuit lounge or something, uh, I've noticed that they respect that separation, and they don't go, "Oh man, you're 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 human." No, it's like this is a character. My personal and professional life is completely different. This is a hobby and a creative outlet, not a lifestyle. Uh, for those of you who want it to be a lifestyle, be safe. Um, don't let it jeopardize your safety and comfort because real life is not kind, especially to people who don't fit in like us. So from my perspective, keep things separate, keep things safe, have your characters live a separate life unless you know the consequences of not having that separation. Uh, and doxing is definitely one of those things, which, you know, you can try as much as you want, but hopefully it never happens to you because it is a horrific, horrific thing. Anyone else have any And on that problems? positive note, I think that's it. Now we're going to do another one. Um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, furry YouTube. Uh, again, there, there'll be that furry YouTube chat. Will one of you link it, maybe, question mark? Will, will one of you post it on Twitter? The I thought it was the secret YouTube chat. It's like not Kuhn. secret. I thought Kuhn was like I made it. Or no. It's yeah. literally a public chat. Really? Yes. I created it to be public. I'm mean, joking. It was the secret YouTuber chat. For All right, everybody, the secret YouTuber chat is open if you're a secret YouTuber furry yeah, like us. Secret YouTuber so. furry, uh, <laughs> one of them will I don't know, maybe I'll put it, I'll, I'm going to be uploading this video onto my channel if you want one of my business cards to see where my channel is. Uh, I'll, put the, I'll put the invite link in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe to all three of us, please, because we're awesome, right? I'm Odin Wolf, and I used to have a second channel named Nido Flow, but they nuked it for no reason. So that one's gone. Uh, also, you can check me on a Patreon at patreon.com slash OdinWolf, and um, it's actually really great, and I've made my best friend my entire life through that Discord, so if you're interested in it, check it out. You would like a card before you go? Uh, you can come out from here. You, say something before All we're done. Right. I have RL Furry Productions. RL Furry Productions on YouTube and RL nice. Furry Videos on Twitter. RL Furry Videos and I have stickers with my underwear on my head if you want them. That's a stream. <laughs> That's a stream. <laughs> Hello! Like, comment, subscribe.
All right, I think we're over, and if you want to play pictures, I think we have this room for a teeny bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm open for pictures if you want, but yeah.